Good. Hello. Thank you very much, everybody. Now for something quite different to the previous talk. Let's see if we can get going. Good. I'd like to start with a question. What do you think the first word ever spoken was? You might think that we started with something like hello. But actually, humans and many other species have lots of different ways to greet each other that don't require words, that don't require language. What we have with language is this incredibly powerful social tool. With language, I can articulate any idea that comes to my mind, and I get to share it with all of you. With language, we have poetry, we have philosophy. With language, we have physics, we put people on the moon. With language, we also gossip about our friends and put cat memes on the internet, right? We use it to inform each other, we use it to deceive. But despite spending centuries at this point thinking about it and working on it, we don't really have a very good answer to the question of what language is for. What was the first sentence? What did we, as a species, need to communicate that was going to take us beyond the systems of signals that we see used by other animal species around us today? Well, unfortunately, I can't go and dig up the fossilized words from our evolutionary past, but what we can do is look at the species communication systems and look for patterns, especially in our closest relatives, the other great apes. We can look for patterns of similarity, we can look for patterns of distinction, and they will allow us to travel back down our evolutionary journey. When I say evolutionary journey, some of you might be having a picture a little bit like this in your minds, uh, you know, going from the simplest forms of life to the pinnacle of evolutionary development that is humankind. Uh, this is very, very wrong. <laughs> so this is what evolution is like. Every single species that you see out there today came from the same point of origin and has traveled along its own evolutionary journey. And we are just one tiny little line in the incredible variation that we see around us in the world today. One of the things that often happens when we're doing these comparisons between humans and other species is that we usually ask the question, can they do what we do? We actually forget that often an important question is, can we do what they do? Can we communicate underwater like a dolphin? Nope. Can we sense through ultrasonic vibrations in our feet communication signals from kilometers away the way that an elephant does? Definitely not. There are incredible aspects to other species communication that just have nothing to do with us. But we're a very self-absorbed species generally, and we keep bringing it back to this question of, is there anything that is characteristic, unique, special about our system of communication, human language? Having a think about other species systems of communication, one of the things that's really useful to keep in mind is that most animals broadcast information to the world around them. It's a little bit like having a sort of radio. You might have an idea of who your audience is, but you don't know if they're there or not, if they're paying attention. You're basically broadcasting information to the world around you. And actually, we still use those same kinds of signals too. We, if, I was in, uh, if I'm in the kitchen and I pick up a pan on the stove and it's hot and I've burnt my hand, right? I'm gonna yelp, I might blow on my fingers, and if we're in the kitchen and you see that information that I'm broadcasting, you understand the pan is hot. You get information from my signal. But I didn't really intend to share it with you. I would have yelped even if there was nobody there. I might yell a bit louder or longer. I might swear depending on who my audience is in the room. But fundamentally, what I would do with language would be very different. What I can do with language is half an hour later, when my hand isn't burning anymore, tell someone coming into the kitchen to watch out, be careful, the pan is hot. I can think about the fact that I might need to tell that person coming into the kitchen, but I don't need to tell you because I know you already know, and I know they don't. So with language, we are communicating ideas and information to, with a specific goal to a specific partner in order to achieve something in that exchange. And it is really very different to what we see with most other species systems of communication. Until very recently, with one striking exception. 
because it revolutionized the field of animal communication when we realized that the other great apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, are using their gestures in this same language-like way. They are exchanging them between individuals with a particular goal in mind. So great ape gesture seemed like this fantastic system of communication to compare to human language. We could use it to explore all of the different structures that we might be interested in. We could look for lexicons. There are hundreds of different gestures out there that the apes are using. We could ask what those gestures mean. We could look at how they're combined into different structures and sequences. So it seemed this really promising starting point, and we did a lot of work on this together. But it started to bother me the more that I worked on it that it felt like this approach was never actually going to get us the answer to the question of why we have language. And fundamentally, that's because what we're doing here is describing the toolkit. We're describing the different things, the different tools that a species has in their system of communication, and we're comparing them to the tools that we have in our toolkit. And honestly, the simple answer is, we share the same toolkit with many, if not most, other species. It doesn't get us to the interesting possible differences going on with human language. Sidney Brenner said, the difference between the telephone directory and a Shakespeare's play is that while both have a grand cast of characters, only the play has a plot. Now, he was talking there about DNA. He was explaining that if you know the structure of DNA in great detail, you might not necessarily still be able to explain the full richness of human behavior. But the same point works for communication. What we are doing at the moment is describing the grand cast of characters. We've got the tools in the toolkit, but we're missing the plot. We need to start to think about not what is available to us, but what are we doing with those systems of communication? What do we use language for? What are apes using their language for in order to be able to take the next step? I think that there are some really promising things that we can start to explore when we do this. And here's one example that I'd like to walk you through. One of the characteristic forms of human meaning is that we have what we call occasion meaning. Now, the opposite to that, or the counterpart to it, is timeless meaning. Timeless meaning is the meaning that a word or a gesture or a phrase has across every instance of its use. It's sort of the shared general meaning that's present. Occasion meaning is the meaning that's constructed in one specific occasion of use, and it's something we are doing all the time with language. So here's an example of what that might look like. Imagine you are driving your car down the road, there's a car coming in the other direction, and they flash their lights at you. Now, the kind of timeless meaning of this, I suppose, might be something like, hey, pay attention, but there's no specific response when someone flashes their lights at you. You need to try to decode, in this instance of use, what the other driver intends you to understand. And there could be lots of different things going on. So it could be that the other driver is a friend of yours. It could be that the other driver is saying there's a problem with your car. Your engine block might be on fire. It could be that they're warning you that there's no big problem right now, but up ahead a little bit, you, there, there's something coming around the corner, so you might want to slow down. And your reaction in each of these scenarios is going to be different. You need a different response, depending on what... Um, the other driver intends you to understand on this occasion. Now, we are doing this all the time with language, and it is intuitively very easy to us. So we get a signal, and we decode it from context. We look at the other person's car, and we don't recognize it, so it's not our friend. We check our car, and it's hopefully not on fire, and so we know that we don't have an immediate problem. And so in this occasion, in this instance of use, we know that we probably need to slow down because there might be danger ahead. We have constructed meaning together as an interaction between two individuals. And that meaning that we constructed was quite different, uh, that would be quite different depending on you know, which occasion we use it, who we construct it with, what our relationship is like. And it's a very distinctive characteristic of what we do with language. You can imagine uh, if I came across somebody and I said, hi, nice shoes, that would be maybe a compliment. I really like their shoes. If I used exactly the same phrase, high nice shoes, with the same intonation and the same pattern and the same signal and the same words, 
but I used it in response to them asking, do you like my hat? Suddenly that has a whole other meaning to it. So we need to start to be getting at this different type of meaning, this characteristically human type of meaning, and asking whether or not other species can also have that flexibility. Do they also have that diversity, that ability to co-construct meaning with another partner? And here's the rub. Every way in which we have been looking at other species communication does not allow us to do that. Because what we do with other species is we say we need these big data sets. I have spent almost 20 years running around rainforests collecting gestural data on apes and then going, what does a chimp do when it reaches its arm out? What do gorillas do when they fling a hand? What's the average kind of, you know, across this data? And what that gives me is the timeless meaning. But that's the meaning that we already know that we share, probably with a lot of other species. And it does not allow us to ask the question that we need to about whether or not other apes or other species share the characteristic of occasion meaning. Now, I think that we're missing out by doing this, but we're going to need some new methods to start to think about it. So I'd like to walk you through a couple of quick examples of where I think we might be starting to see some hints that some other species are able to use those gestural tools in different ways on different occasions. We're going to have a little look at culture and a little look at deception. So first of all, the culture conundrum. When we think about human language, it is all about diversity and variation. We have over 7,000 spoken languages, over 200 signed languages, and we see these group differences all of the time. But we don't look for group differences in other species. As I was just saying, we look at what a chimp does, what a gorilla does as a species level. And by doing that, we're missing out on some really interesting um, nuance and variation. So to help me walk through this, I'd like to introduce you to Nora and Bahati. These are two young female chimpanzees from the beautiful Bodongo rainforest up in northwestern Uganda. Um, I've known them since they were babies, but at about 10 or 11 years old, like most female chimpanzees, they moved to a new community, basically at adolescence. And a couple of years later, when I was working with one of the neighboring groups, I found them there in the group that we now know today as Waibira. We will come back to them in a second, but first I need to teach you something about chimpanzee pickup lines, which is that chimpanzees, if they are flirting with another chimpanzee, if they're essentially requesting sex with another chimpanzee, they have a very characteristic gesture. You take a leaf and you tear it with this characteristic sound. Do with that information what you will, I am not responsible. <laughs> um, when we started to look at these gestures in a bit more detail, we noticed that there were some interesting patterns of variation. So they tear, the gesture, the, they tear these leaves in different parts of the leaf. So perhaps through the middle, perhaps plucking it off. And actually, when we looked at the two groups, we saw that in the Sonso community, they are leaf clippers, they tear through the middle. In the Waibira community, they're using a bit all of the vari variants, but they're leaf pullers, they pull them off at one end. Now, this is already exciting, because what we already have here is stable group differences in the expression of a gesture form between two different communities. This is starting to look like something like accent or dialect. It lets us start to ask questions about, for example, behavioral norms. What happens if you were born in London and you moved to St. Andrews? What does your accent sound like? So we can ask that question now for Nora and Bahati. So they were born in Sonso, and we know that they were using and understanding leaf clips, but when they moved to Iberia, they did not miss a beat. And they are understanding and using leaf pulls just as well today. So what we have are two chimpanzees who are varying their use and understanding of a gesture depending on the occasion, depending on the social circumstances that are influencing and shaping how that communication system is being used. Okay. Oops, sorry. The other one that we're going to have a quick whirlwind tour of is deception. And here I need to introduce you to Flanley and Jeje. Flanley and Jeje come from a Bosu community in Guinea in West Africa. They are stone tool using chimpanzees. So what they have here is a nice flat anvil stone and a hammer stone. And they're using it to crack open these nuts that are too hard for them to bite into. Now, Jeje is the alpha male. He's off to the side here, and he sort of knows what he's doing. And this is Flanley, the young male. And he's frankly not very good at this yet. It takes a while to learn how to nut crack properly. And what he's actually got 
are two hammer stones. And he's got these stones have been rolling around and it's just not working for him. But in a moment, he's going to notice that just in front of the alpha male is another stone. There we go. You've seen it. Ooh, that looks quite interesting. Maybe this is the key to being able to actually crack those nuts open. But there's a problem. The problem is that this stone is right in front of the alpha male. And in chimpanzee society, you don't just go and pick that up. That would not be the done thing. So he's got to find a solution, and he goes back to using his very terrible, kind of not well put together toolkit here, and it's rolling around, and we've got nuts that ping off in all kinds of directions, and this is generally not going on. So he gets up after a few moments, and what he's going to do is invite Zhizhi to play with a classic play gesture. Raise your arm and the object up in the air, Zhizhi gets up and, oh look, I seem to have accidentally ended up with your stone in my hand. And JJ, I love him for bits. He's perhaps not the brightest of alpha males, and he just sort of goes, hmm, and sits back down. <laughs> but we can have a look at this interaction and break it down into more detail. Because what could have happened there, it could well have been the case that Flanley was nutcracking, he got frustrated, he got bored, he decided he wanted to play, and that that was an honest signal of play. And then, you know, while he's signaling for play, he sort of notices the stone and goes, oh, yeah, well, maybe I'll do that instead. And it's a kind of stream of consciousness series of honest signals that he's using. And Flanley uses this signal a lot to ask for play. So this is him asking for play from his little brother. But what you're going to see is, as well as this arm raise, there's another signal. And this is a play face. It's this big facial expression that chimpanzees use when they want to play. And you can see when Flanley wants to play and when play happened after he gave that signal, in every case he's got that big play face going on. And facial expressions, as they are for humans, are very difficult to suppress in apes. It's very much the same for us. You know when you, you really shouldn't smile but you kind of just can't help it, how hard it is not to. So if you have an honest motivation to play as an ape, you will have a play face on. So we can take another little look at that interaction from earlier and see that he has an absolute poker face. So I think this is exactly the kind of thing that suggests that in this case, he was taking an honest signal from his repertoire and on this occasion, he was constructing a false meaning in order to deceive Zhezhe and be able to make off with his stone tool. So now we have other apes who are using their gestures in order to co-construct not only meaning that varies perhaps by occasion, but even possibly false or fake meaning that varies by occasion. So we're getting to some of these really interesting uses that I think are much more representative of what we do with human language on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're able to see and compare and start to detect them in some of these other species. So to circle back around to that quote from earlier, if we're thinking about how apes are using their tools, how apes are using their communicative tools, their gestures, we get to ask a much more profound question to provide a much more profound description of ape gesture. We also get a much more appropriate and interesting comparison with human language. But we need these new methods to do it. We need to be bringing the context back in. We need to be asking about individual identity. Who is the one communicating? Who are they communicating to? What's going on in that interpersonal context? What happened just before? We have to add in, in apes as in humans, the plot if we want to go away from this grand cast of characters. And if you'll indulge me with one last quote, Douglas Adams once said, I may not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I've ended up where I needed to be. And I think actually in terms of the study of the origins of human language, this is kind of where we're at. We've been working on this for decades at this point. And in many ways right now, we're having to really fundamentally rethink how we ask these questions. But I think by starting over, we're finally starting over from the right place. Thank you very much.